Hey, greetings. Pastor Tim Doyle here from Restoration Church. We're so glad that you're watching on the live stream today. We're really grateful for this technology that connects us to wherever you are in the world today watching. We know that we have folks from all over the globe connecting to what's happening here. We call it the miracle at Second and Francis here in the heart of beautiful, historic downtown St. Joseph, Missouri. We love what God is doing in this old warehouse, and we're glad that you are a part of it. Of course, we'd love to have you here in person. That would be ideal. But if you can't get here, then live stream is the next best thing. So let us know where you're watching from today, and let's go straight into the service. I think Chastity has enough energy for all those people in there. <laughs> How many of you enjoyed having Chastity on Mother's Day with us? So good. I love the relationships that God is, is making. And today, you've come to the right place if it's your first time. We welcome you into this family. We love what is happening here at Second and Francis. Glad you're with us today. And um, it's our five-year anniversary. Did anybody mention that? Uh, five years in downtown St. Joseph. Yeah, come on. Let's thank God for what he's done. It's also Grandparents' Day today. I get to celebrate for the first time, Grandpa. <laughs> it's awesome. You know, again, it's really all about family. That's what God uh, created. Uh, when, he, when he had the idea to put Adam and Eve in the garden, his heart, his mind was toward family. And uh, we just get to experience that today. So we welcome you to the family at Restoration. If it's your first time, Krista and I will be back in the back. We'd love to meet you and give you a gift this morning and welcome you to the family. Um, before we get going, someone had sent me a message th this morning during worship, and I just want to read it real quickly. And it was uh, a brother who sent something that the Lord was saying to him, and I'll just read you what he wrote. He said, what I began to pray was that the Lord's love, grace, and spirit would flow through and out of this house, just as the river he placed us next to. This flow will become overpowering, even uncontrollable at times, but just as the river does, it will bring new life to our city that will flow well beyond St. Joseph. That's a word from heaven, and I say amen to that. I learned something last week that I didn't know before. Maybe some of you knew this. I was talking to one of the downtown business owners, and when they were rehabilitating their building, a little a couple blocks east of us here, he said, we discovered and didn't know that there is an underground river that flows through St. Joseph. There's an underground river, and whenever they get to tapping into the foundations and into the basements of these buildings, this flow begins to happen. He goes, it wasn't like a garden hose. He said, it was like a fire hydrant. And I just thought, well, that's, that's not a good thing for your basement, but it's a great thing for the city spiritually to know that we are built on an underground river that flows, and that's what that word reminded me of. And so I think that's something we need to hang on to and pray into. Let the river flow. Lord, let it go. Let it flow from this house and beyond. Um, we've had a great weekend already. I've got to tell you, a busy one. We just got back last night, late last night, from House of David. It uh, happens to be Rosh Hashanah weekend. So the new year on the Hebrew calendar begins tonight. And so a couple of shots here to show you. That's where we were last night. I got to show you, I'm proud of, of Krista and James. They were blowing their shofars until they were red in the face. Now, I don't know, James, if you can get red in the face, but Krista was red in the face for sure. But <laughs> we're going to celebrate Rosh Hashanah tonight at six o'clock, our normal sanctuary uh, worship and prayer time. We're going to turn that into a simulcast with House of David. They never have a Sunday night service, but they are tonight. And I said, heck yeah, we're going to just tag team on. So we're going to celebrate with House of David. We'll be bringing our shofars. If you got one, bring it. We're going to blast it. This is the Feast of Trumpets. And we're believing that last year is behind us, and a new year 
is ahead. We're going to leave it all behind in last year and look at the good things God's doing in the new year. How awesome that on our fifth anniversary, we get to also celebrate that. That might have been on purpose five years ago when we planted the church. Maybe or maybe not. Would you turn with me in your scripture to Luke chapter 2 today? We are continuing on this series the, the entire month of September, five Sundays, and so that works out really well with five years. And I'm focusing on five areas of grace we're asking God to increase. The number five is associated with the word grace in the Hebrew. So we are saying, yeah, God, we want more grace in this year to come. So five different areas. Last year we talked about grace to grow. And this week we're talking about grace to gain. As you're turning to Luke 2, I just want to mention that we have a, a birthday party for restoration that we're inviting the city to. We're calling it River Fest. We're taking it down to the river. Speaking of the river, um, just showing a, a spotlight on that significant piece of history of our city where uh, a lot of our history was birthed and believing that that's going to be a chance to just bless our town, but also to um, show the significance of why God put this city where he did. So it's October the 6th. Some of you got an email this week. Uh, many of you have already said I'll help in certain areas. We've got some good committees going. We've got some good committee heads. Could use some more volunteers. So if you'd like to help, uh, respond to the email that you'll receive if you're on the bridge this week. Also, I'll let you know that what we'll do on September 30th, the final day of our, of our month of celebration, we're going to take an anniversary offering. And what I would like to focus that offering on this year is to help us get heat in the house so that we can keep having church in this room in the wintertime. I really don't want to go back in there. I really don't. Nothing wrong with that room. I love that room. It's a great room. He just can't hold us all, you know? We outgrew that room. So we want to stay in this house. Uh, someone gave us a furnace, if you remember that, a while back. It was a boiler. We were advised by multiple people, you don't want a boiler. You really don't want that. So we're grateful for the gift, but we are asking God to give us the answer for what we need for this house. Will you agree with me on that? So anniversary offering on September the 30th, just to, to say, God, thank you for five years. We are looking forward to the next five, and that'll start in the new year with a new furnace and heat for this building. And we'll deal with air next year, okay? How about that? Today, greater grace to gain. And I can hear you today because we don't have a multitude of fans blowing around the room. So now, no excuse. I really need to hear you talking back to me today as we talk about this idea and identity to grow uh, in, in gain. And we're going to talk about two different things that, that I'm focusing on today. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Good morning to our friends watching online this morning. It says this in the NIV, Jesus grew. Say grew. We talked about that last week, right? Grace to grow. How did he grow? In wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Those are the things I'm asking God to help us gain this year is wisdom and favor in particular. We need wisdom and we need favor. Let's talk about what those two words mean. I'm just going to read some scriptures that highlight wisdom. I'm pretty sure you know what it means, but the scripture gives us a, a clearer picture, more of a well-rounded idea of what wisdom is about. Proverbs 1, 7, you probably know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, to say, yeah, God, what you say is true, and I will agree with you. Proverbs 4, 6, do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Listen to some of the ways wisdom operates. Wisdom protects us. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, <laughs> get wisdom. Isn't that good? The beginning of wisdom, where you start? Get you some, get you some wisdom. That's good. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. First Corinthians one twenty-five. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Colossians 2.2, 2, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Isn't that awesome to know that in Jesus, all those treasures are there and he's opened the way for us to know him personally and to share in that wisdom and knowledge. Love that. James 3.17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven 
is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Take that definition and stack it against the world's definition of wisdom, and you see the contrast. I take heaven's version any day. That's what we need is the wisdom that comes from above. And it says he grew in wisdom and in stature. I'm not going to dwell on stature a lot because you pretty much know what that means. It's not just, though, getting taller, which I, I, would, I would accept that. I want to be as tall as Matt Long someday when I grow up. But also it's just being a bigger person, just being a mature person, one who you know, doesn't react to a situation but has the composure, the stature, if you will, to stand, even when you feel threatened and you feel like, you know, that, that temptation to rise up in you and, and get into a mode that's kind of not very pretty, um, to have the statue, if you think of a statue, what do statues do? They stand, <laughs> not to be moved. Uh, no matter what the wind and the weather is like, you're there, you're solid. You're on a firm foundation to grow in stature. And I really want to focus on this third word, favor, today. Love the word favor. Same word could be translated grace throughout the New Testament. So favor and grace are kind of synonymous, but not the saving kind of grace. Um, the commentator White says the good pleasure of God was upon Jesus. That's the kind of grace we're talking about. Jesus grew in his personal relationships, both with his heavenly father, but also in his human relationships and in friendship. And that's what I want to focus on today. When we ask God to help us gain wisdom and favor, that's what I'm talking about. We need heavenly wisdom and we need favor with God, but also with man. And it's been an interesting week. You know, it, it never fails. Whenever I'm preaching on a topic, the Lord always gives me some wonderful personal examples the week that I'm preaching that message. And so I'm going to tell you about some of those things. I want to go to the scripture first, though. It says in Psalm 5, for you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. And then it says, and I'm going to read this together, Psalm 90. Would you read with me together, either on the screen or in your Bible? Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Say amen to that. Yeah, Psalm 84. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Psalm 30, verse 5, his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. And Psalm 89, 17, by your favor, you make us strong. I want me some wisdom and some favor. How about you? I mean, it, talk about an area that we could say, God, we want to grow in this area. We want to gain more wisdom, more favor in the, the season that we're walking into. And I believe that would be something God would, would answer if we cry for it. We need wisdom and favor in this day to be effective in the way that God's called his church to be. I got to tell you, last week was a whirlwind for me. Um, long about Thursday, I got word that there was some uh, legislation coming down uh, the pipe at City Hall. And I'd known about it since May. I know that the city was considering this ordinance. Um, and it basically is it's anti-discrimination legislation that exists at the federal and state level already. And about eight different cities in Missouri have taken it upon themselves to, to further extend what it already exists. It's about discriminating, particularly in the workplace and employment, against uh, discrimination for people. No one could be discriminated because of age or race or ethnicity or uh, nationality or military service because in some cases there's prejudice against uh, our veterans um, and those are all really good things but this legislation takes it a step further and says there should be no discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity and that has become the hot button issue and you've probably read newspaper articles around the country and this has been a thing um, you know, in the 90s when I worked at Focus, this is some of the issues that we dealt with. And here's what I want to say, church, to you. Um, first of all, unequivocally, <laughs> believers of all people should want no person to ever be discriminated against for any reason. For any reason. That's the truth. I'm afraid sometimes the church has been 
negligent in standing up for people who oftentimes are marginalized. And so I just want to make that a bold upfront statement. The challenge that we had with the, the language of the ordinance that's coming down for vote tomorrow was that it could potentially have the reverse effect on people of faith. In other words, people who would subscribe to the Bible's definition of sexuality could find themselves in a position of being discriminated against because of their position. Are you, do you understand what I'm saying? So in no way would we say any person should be discriminated against. However, I also believe that the church and people of faith also have freedom of speech and freedom of religion to be able to say that this is what I believe the Bible says about that. I wanted to make sure that pastors and churches were free to take that position, not discriminate against people, but not to be discriminated against from saying what they are convicted and what they believe the scripture preaches. Are you hearing me today? I want to make that very clear. Now listen, I'm not going political on you at all, but when I learned that that language had been removed from the ordinance that originally was in there in May, I knew that we, we had an issue. So I began to contact the mayor, began to contact our city council representatives, and I'll tell you what, that was, that was Wednesday evening that I got the word. Thursday morning, I began to make contact. By Thursday night, the language in the ordinance was changed to exempt churches and all religious organizations. It they, does not apply to them. So <laughs> I'm grateful. It's like I'm walking both sides of this issue because on one hand, I never want the church to be known as a discriminatory body. Come on. I mean, that's a, that is a black mark against us. If we're discriminating against anyone, on the other hand, we also need freedom to say that we can preach and say what we believe the Bible says, our conviction of what the scripture teaches. So it was, it was awesome, but then I, all of a sudden I began to get these comments from pastors and they started getting stirred up. And I'm like, listen, <laughs> You know, I love my pastors, but, but I, they began to grab for their torches and pitchforks and we're going to march to City Hall, right? And I'm like, no, 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 that is not the way you do this. Listen to what just happened. I contacted the mayor, I contacted my city representatives. I got response. That's the way this works. So if you want to be a part of helping shape the culture, you've got to be at the table. You've got to have a seat at the table for the discussion. And so we begin this dialogue, and I'm not going to drag you through all of it, but I just would say this. I'm grateful for a mayor and a city council who were responsive to the concerns of the clergy and said, yeah, you're right. We don't want to shut churches down and, and cause them to have to be drugged before a human rights commission every time they talk about something from the Bible that they believe the Bible teaches. But it still leaves a concern for people like Christian employers and stuff. So by no means is it an issue that's put to bed. I'm just telling you this. As believers, we must have a seat at the table. And you can't wait until the 11th hour to raise your voice and be all upset if you weren't a part of the process all along. Listen, this thing has been discussed since the month of May. There were four public work sessions that anyone could attend and comment. There was a public reading two weeks ago on a Monday night. They're voting tomorrow night. Christians, why do we wait until the end and then fuss about things that are going on when we had no part of the process going on? We were in no dialogue with people. All they know is what we're against. And that's wrong. If you want wisdom and influence, you'll act smarter than that. And I will defend all day long anyone's right to not be discriminated against. May it never be. May St. Joseph be known as a place, like we just read about, of family, of love, of ones who honor each other, even when we disagree. Come on. Can you say yes and amen to that? See, this is what's wrong in America today, I believe. You watch these Kavanaugh hearings, Good night. Are you kidding me? It's ridiculous. Are these people even adults? It's like a bunch of kindergartners. I, I really, I, I'm just stunned by what I see. But it's the spirit of the age that we live in. Church, we can do better than that. We can let people know that we love them. And we can lovingly take our position grow in stature, right? Not have to be moved around by every opinion everybody has. Say, this is the word of God. This is what, what we believe and what we stand on. But that doesn't mean that we reject people or that we treat them ugly and mean. Are you hearing me today? I hope so, because we need a change in discourse in this city. So I had that experience 
on, on Wednesday and Thursday. Thursday afternoon, I hosted a talk show on Facebook Live with the mayor, the city manager, and one of our council representatives to explain what's this ordinance about, what's it mean, and tell us about this amendment you just put in, Mayor, you know, to help people realize, okay, there was a response. That Facebook Live has been shared by so many people, even folks on the other side of the issue, because they appreciate the level-headedness and the common-sense approach to just get the dialogue out there when we're not throwing things at each other. Are you hearing me? Like, we've got to have these discussions. And you might have strong feelings about that ordinance and the, even the way it's still worded. I encourage you strongly to contact your city council. I encourage you to contact your mayor. I encourage you to go to the meeting Monday night at 7 o'clock and voice your opinion. Public input is always welcome. But can I just say this? All I ever see at city council meetings, because I go there frequently, to pray. Did you know that city council invites pastors to pray before every meeting? Did you know that for 15 years... We have been scheduling pastors to go pray at the mayor's request. Come on. Now, let's, let's be grateful for the stuff that we know is good. Let's not just fuss about the stuff we don't like. And that's all I hear often in public comment at those city council meetings, is people getting up and griping. I would use another B word, but I'm going to be polite. Just telling you, if all you got to say is something bad, then... What, what are you for? And are you participating positively in the process? I'm giving you just a little bit of a scolding today because what I have seen is if we dare to say, God, give us wisdom and favor. Favor also equals influence. And you earn the right to be heard by walking in wisdom, by using, I would say, the Father's heart of, Father heart of God in those discussions. So we had the talk show. I had my discussion with the mayor and all that. We had the talk show. Thursday morning, I'm at a meeting downtown with some of the business leaders of the downtown area. Um, they've asked me to help sit in on a group that's moving our downtown forward in the future, which I'm just grateful to have a seat at that table as well. And then on Friday morning, before I left for Oklahoma, I hosted a pastor's breakfast with the new superintendent of St. Joseph's Schools so that these pastors could get to know him, meet him, express their questions and concerns and say, how can we support you? See, all I hear oftentimes in the public discourse is negativity toward the school district or those who run it. And I just want to say, so where are you being a part of the process in a positive way? Where are you helping? Have you ever once called your school principal and said, what do you need? How can I help you? I'm just stunned that Christians are so hesitant to do that. And it's no wonder then we've lost influence in the culture. I'm just saying there's a better way. I'm saying wisdom and favor. Wisdom and favor. Are you with me on that? I'm not going to make restoration a political church. I'm not going to do that. People have left this church because I wouldn't come out either strongly for or strongly against certain candidates. And I'm just telling you, I don't feel that's my job as your pastor. My job is to equip you for the work of ministry. That's my job, okay? I'm going to do my job. And if you need it done some other way, you can go someplace else and do that. And as a citizen, I have opinions about things, don't I? I have a right to an opinion. But I'm just saying this, I want the church to be the church because Jesus said the gates of hell couldn't stand against that. I want to be a part of that organization, you know? I'm preaching now, aren't I? I'm just saying, look at what's happened in the last three or four days and how, you know, by God's grace, wisdom and favor has allowed us to have a seat at the table. And I'm saying, Lord, give us more wisdom and more favor in the coming year. Um, I want to show you a short video clip. I saw Chris Valaton, who was one of the pastors at Bethel. He talked about our influence as believers, and it really spoke to me. I want you to watch this for a second. I was sitting recently in a very powerful place in a country with some political people that were leading the country. I walked in, I sat there, I was waiting in the waiting room, you know, the whole deal, security, secret service. My anxiety was growing. Lord, I have no education. Lord, I, I, I'm not, I, I just began to recite in my mind all the reasons 
that I shouldn't be here. And finally, the Lord said to me, <clears throat> you belong here. You're one of the kings I'm king over. Kings disciple kings. Slaves don't disciple anyone. Now act like a son. He's coming in the room. Mm. Almost every time I end up in these places, as I walk in now, the Lord says, you belong here. I'm trying to say that if we want to disciple nations and not just disciple peaceful nations, we got to change positions. we got to become friends with God. Because friends know all things. And when we sit down with the world leader and he begins to tell us the problems of his world and we're sitting there and we're thinking I have no idea what to do but I have a friend I can call and he knows everything he's Google God <laughs> I can Google God right now I'll just do it while you're talking God we got a problem here all things this guy's got an issue right here I was in a country and we were, we, were, we were in this particular city, in this foreign country, and uh, had, I got there through a friend of a friend, a mayor of the city, the mayor of this, one of the largest cities in this particular foreign country. We're, 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 in, we're sitting in the, in the room, and the, the man happened to speak English, even though that was in his first language, and so we had a really good 10 minutes. And then he said to me, um, kind of uncomfortably, well, my friend told me that you're a, what are you? I said, uh, yeah, I'm a futurist. He said, yeah, futurist, whatever that is. I said, I know the future. He said, really, can you tell me the future? He said, yeah. So I said, well, let's, we were up three stories in this ornate building. I said, let's walk over to the, this window. And there was this beautiful, big, huge plate glass window, about the size of that screen. I said, see that right out there? He said, yeah. That, I said, see that, that land right there? He said, yeah. I said, there's two companies, and I named the companies, American companies. They're, you're going to do a partnership with them. They're going to build a university right there. It's going to be a high-tech university in the Silicon Valley. There's like the, the Silicon Valley of America, it's going to be the Silicon Valley of your country. It's going to happen right there. And these two companies, you're going to give them the land, and, they're going, and you're going to build a partnership with them to build this university, this high-tech university like MIT. He looks at me and he goes, nobody knows this. I said, what? He said, I met with them three days ago. Those two companies, we just gave them the land. We're building a university there. He said, what else do you know? I said, I know you're going to redo the water, system, the water system of the community. He said, that's right. I said, you're going to hit an artesian well. It's going to be the best, the purest water. I said, you ever heard of Fiji water? He said, yeah. It said, this water is going to be famous all over Europe. You're going to bottle it. You're going to sell it. You're going to have more than you need for your city. Anyway, I, I stand up to go, and he goes, hey, when you come back, you just come anytime and meet with me. How many know God knows all things? We belong here. We are sons and daughters of the king. We have access to all the answers to the world's problems. Would you stand? Amazing. So, you know, Chris obviously moves in a prophetic gifting, and so he might be a little more advanced in it than most of us, but I'm just telling you, when you have a seat at the table, when people know your heart, you're not coming in with napalm and flamethrowers, but you're there as a friend of God, and you've come in to be to bring solution, <laughs> not just conflict. How many of you know you'll get a lot further that way? How did Jesus respond to the uh, people of the day he didn't agree with? People that were in maybe the profession of collecting taxes or the people that were uh, living in sin, even caught in adultery. His response to them, first message out of the gate wasn't to slam them. He built a relationship with them he spoke truth, but he didn't out of the gate take a sledgehammer and bash their head in because of their lifestyle. Are you hearing me? Who was he hard on? Who did he blow away? Called them snakes and vipers and whitewashed tombs. Come on. The religious people who thought they had it all going on. You see, they forgot the heart of God. I should be able to have a discourse with someone with whom I disagree, and they should still know that I'm, I care about them. But I want God's best for them. That's determination by our heart. Jesus said it like this, believer, Matthew 10, 16. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. I like what the message says. 
It says, stay alert. This is hazardous work I'm assigning to you. You're going to be like sheep running through a wolf pack. So don't call attention to yourselves. Be as cunning as a snake, inoffensive. A great word, as a dove. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said this, the mission of sheep to wolves is a hopeful one. Since we see in the natural world that the sheep, though feeble, by far outnumber the wolves who are so fierce. Isn't that interesting? You've been called as sheep among the wolf pack. It's kind of scary, but listen to what a commentator says here. Despite their vulnerable position, Jesus' followers were not to defend themselves with worldly forms of power. They were to remain harmless as doves, though wise as serpents. Wisdom would keep them from attracting trouble unnecessarily or show them how to avoid it without compromise. Serpents are attacked by everyone, say amen, and must use creativity and wisdom to survive. Isn't that interesting? He said, remaining harmless keeps them from giving in to the temptation of retaliation. Did you hear that? Remaining harmless keeps them, us, from giving in to the temptation of retaliation. Is that not what you see in politics today? Not just the temptation of retaliation, but full-blown, head-on, in your face, I don't care, coming through, bowl you over, get out of my way. I think that's not biblical, according to what we just read. Spurgeon also said, the Christian missionary will need to be wary to avoid receiving harm, but he must be of a guileless mind that he do no harm. I just think this is an amazing opportunity for us. No no coincidence that this week with all the fuss in Washington and then the, the uh, little hornet's nest that I found uh, here at home, that the Lord is teaching us about wisdom and favor. I'm going to close with this, 1 Timothy 6. This is Paul's admonition to his young pastor. And since we share the same name, I take his counsel as my own. That these are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest, listen to this, in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, and in doing so, have departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. And if you need grace like I do, say amen. Yes, Jesus, give us grace greater grace with wisdom and favor on this fifth anniversary year we're asking god for more of his grace more of his unmerited favor particularly in the area of wisdom and favor in this coming biblical year 5779 i told you earlier about our anniversary offering about i feel like we're supposed to focus it on getting heat for this room these are ways you can help us pray as we move forward and asking God for greater wisdom and, and favor to influence um, not only our city, but as was said in the word earlier, even beyond St. Joseph. And there's a man here today that I know has that kind of a heart, a um, man who has great favor in the business world, but also has been a leader, a strong leader in the uh, church world as well. He's a man who carries an ability to speak before kings and... Uh, Take, take wisdom into an arena that oftentimes we're fearful to tread. And I appreciate how much I've learned from him. So would you welcome our friend James Harris to our fifth anniversary celebration today. <laughs> well, good morning. It is so good to be with you this morning. And... Um, I'm just excited about what God is doing in this place. Happy fifth anniversary. And I know this has been hard. I, I know what 
five years if in the business world means it means that uh, man you got a chance you got a shot now maybe you can make it they they will tell you in the business world if a, if a business can make it five years they might be able to make it and you have not only made it you have thrived and you're thriving and so congratulations to to you um, Tim and Krista thank you for allowing me to go along with you for the ride it's been a, this it's been an awesome it's been an awesome journey and we have just begun I, I, I say we because I feel like I'm part of you God has uh, done something that um, I cannot explain and that is he's knit as our knitted our hearts together I pray for you um, uh, when there's issues going on within the church that that needs wisdom uh, I'm able to uh, ask God and he he gives me something to say and so today I'm going to do something that's really out of the box for me um, Tim said um, um, you know a little bit about me in the business world and one of the things I've had to learn how to do and it's just part of my it's part of the way I think that's the way God wired me I'm a planner I hate to get up in the morning and not have a plan I mean, I need to have something that gets me up and said, okay, here's where I'm going, here's what I'm doing today. And it's frustrating to me in my mentality to not have that at any time. I roll over and talk to my wife, Wanda, of 40 years, and she's totally different. And uh, I said, what are you going to do today? I don't, I don't know. I don't have a clue. And I look at her and I think, how can you not know what you're going to do today. She goes, I, I don't know what, whatever comes, that's what I'll do. And then she'll turn and say, probably nothing. I go, oh, okay, so you're going to waste 24 hours doing nothing. You know, I don't tell her that. I, I told you we've been married 40 years. I'm still alive. There's things you do not say. You can think it, though. And I oftentimes think it. And occasionally, just being stupid and being a man, it comes out and I go, how do that work for you? You know, because I, as a man, I like to measure uh, what's going on in my life. And when, when we were, uh, gr and the boys can tell you this, when they were growing up, they had to have five goals by, January, by December 31st for, for the new year. Five goals. And they need to be in smart goal form. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Smart goal form. <laughs> and it needs to be, you know, obtainable, measurable, realistic, and time-bound. And so I would, I'd say, okay, I'm going to lose 20 pounds in five days. I go, no, you're not. <laughs> and so it had to be measurable. And, and, and what it does, it, it says to, to you, what have, what have God laid on your heart for that new year? And what is he doing? And so we're entering a new year in the Jewish calendar at sunrise or sunset this afternoon. I don't think it's an accident that I'm here today. And I'm doing something that's out of the box for me. God had me to put what I had for you on the back shelf. And he said, I'm going to give you just a little bit of what I want to say, and then when you get up there and start talking, I'm going to fill your mouth with more things for this church. That's scary for me, guys. That is scary. But I'm going to jump into it because I know he's faithful and he will speak to you. And here's a few of the things I, I, I want to start with. I was in Kansas City almost a month ago. And the grass had started to grow dormant in most of the yards. And things were about to go according to season. And what I mean is, that's about the time. I lived here 20 plus years. I know when it's, going to time, when it's about time I'm, my mowing days are going to be behind me pretty quickly and I come back this time and everything is green and I looked at it and I said oh God what are you doing 
you know, these people are expecting this, but they're getting this. The rain came at the exact time to catch the ground from going into a season that, it wasn't, that he wanted to turn around for a short period of time and green it back up. A little bit later, and you would have had a lot of mud, even though you had a lot of rain. You understand what I'm saying? Why? Because the grass could no longer retain it, and it would have just been run off. The ground couldn't contain the water. And I said, what are you doing, God? What is it you want to say to this people, your people? He says, do you know what time it is? Do you know what time it is? The sons of Issachar, the Bible says in First Chronicles, I think it's chapter 13, they said about the sons of Issachar, here's David. He's bringing in the ark back into him. He's being in Hebron. He's bringing in all of the advisor. He goes to the leaders and he says, I think this is time to bring the ark of the covenant back into the, the city of God. And he said, he's being, he's being installed as king. And David is one of the greatest kings that Israel has ever had. And so he's, he's bringing all the tribes in and all the leaders, and he says, I think this is a good idea. Is it a God idea? And they all began to be counted, and they came and began the work. But here's the sons of Issachar. The Bible names all the different number uh, of, of, of members of the tribe in terms of numbers and leaders. But the sons of Issachar, he says, they discerned the times and season and could tell Israel what to do. We have today, God has given us many in the body of Christ, the spirit of Issachar. Because it wasn't Issachar, it was the sons of Issachar. We're sons. There are remnants of prophetic people walking. And here's what the Lord wants me to tell you. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. And he wants you prepared for the harvest. There's a lot of things going on out in the world right now that we should keep our mouths shut because they're distractions. They're there to take you away from what God is doing. Instead of focusing on Him and trusting Him, we think our opinion is more valuable. You belong to another kingdom, not this. God is not an American to some or part of any political party. I'm going to tell you something here. This is very strong and and I'm not going to apologize for it. I was going to say, forgive me, but I'm not going to apologize for it. And if you get offended about it, then that's between you and God. Okay? But I'm going to be real with you. I was sharing with Tim, as I've come to really love the Hebrew language in many of the ways, the language uh, really has so much insight and definition that as I'm writing my second book it's called The Love of God On the Love of God and one of the chapters is entitled Can You Look at the Facts and Yet Hold On to the Truth The Truth is the Cross The Facts is is that there have been all of our generations all of the um, different cultures and different tribes different uh, color of people have been abused and misused and wronged and it's, it's molded into the fiber of this nation. In other words, it's there. It happened. You can't take it out. And so in part of the Hebrew language, never puts a noun or adjective before a noun. Never. There's no such thing. When they describe an apple, it's an apple red, not a red apple. 
In the famous decoration of John 3.16, Jesus says, I came to save. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe should not perish but have everlasting life. If Jesus came into a world, a sinful world, then the only way to eradicate that world of sin is destroy. But he came to a world in sin. So he came to restore it back to its original form. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? Because if it had been another way around, there was no way to restore it back to its original form. The only way would be to start all over again. And somehow, the stink that we smell in our culture is because we have not gotten involved in the places that we should. We're sitting on the sidelines, pointing a finger, and God has called us to be salt and light. You know what happens when light is removed? Darkness is there. But when light comes, darkness flee. Look at the definition. The definition of darkness is absence of light. I'm a baker by trade. God has called us to be leaven. And when you get leaven into a dough, you cannot take it out. It changes its whole atomic structure. And the yeast in that product begins to feed upon the sugars and shortenings that allows it to rise and become what it's designed to do, which is to be bread to food to feed people with. He has called us to be yeast. He's called us to be leaven. He's called us to get into these places. Leave our junk on the sidelines. I am not, I am not, I am not a black Christian. I am a Christian that's a black man. You understand what I'm saying? And I don't care who you are, you put it, you fill in the blank. Because anything that you put before God has become an idol in your life. That's strong. It's true. God says, I will not have anything before me. He's a jealous God. And when we start taking our culture our ideas, our feelings, our past, all that stuff. He made you that way. He understands that. But that's not who you are. You're part of another kingdom. You serve the king. You are an heir and joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are seated in heavenly places. He sent you here to make heaven, to make this earth, to reflect heaven. That's what Jesus says. That kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He come, he sent you to take this planet that was intended to reflect heaven from the very start, and sin was brought in through deception. And Jesus had to come to redeem it. That's all you can do is redeem. And this silliness that you see of tearing down stat statues and all these things from today's perspective onto yesterday is ludicrous. That's like trying to change history. You cannot change history. History is history. The best thing you can do is learn from history. The whole Bible was written for our, as an example for us so that we don't go the way of Cain. This is not that hard, folks. But it does require something of you. It requires your knee to bow before the King of Kings and the Lords of Lords. And he instores upon you as a child. It's just like Chris was saying a minute ago. We are no longer slaves trying to serve God. We are part of the kingdom of God, and he is our father, and we are his children. And as a child of God, I have rights because I'm part of the kingdom of God. And he's given me authority to tread upon lions and serpents. He's given us power through the Holy Spirit. Do you realize the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you? 
That's resurrection power. You have authority, but it only operates through love. That's amazing. It, it won't operate any other way. What did Jesus, what did, what did God do? He so loved the world. It was the love of his heart to go back and redeem a world by giving himself as a sacrifice for that. And for all of those, I had to relearn some things. And I had to empty myself of some things. Why? Because Jesus emptied himself of all authority, of all majesty, everything else. And he came down here as a man, as you and I. And that's amazing. That's amazing. And he willingly died for us. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy? Generations of generations of sons and daughters birthed because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's harvest time, folks. Don't get your eyes, don't be distracted. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. The fields are white and snow. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into his harvest field. Where's that harvest field at? right where you are. It ain't inside these four walls. You come in here to be, to come together and get instruction, be equipped to practice the presence of the Lord, to ask him to come, to get instructions, to love on each other, but it's out there that you serve. So all of you that's in jobs that you hate, how many of you are in jobs that you hate? Oh, that's great. You got a buddy. That's good. Everybody loves their job. That's good. Some of you lying. You don't want to raise your hand because you may have your, your employer in here too. <laughs> so you want to say, I don't want to get, I don't want to get in trouble here. <laughs> okay. Well, here's the deal. God put you in that place to bring the kingdom of God in that place. Here's the deal. Jesus said, he says, some says the kingdom is here and some says the kingdom is there. And he says, but I tell you, the kingdom of God is within you. So everywhere you go, you take the kingdom with you. In this place of turmoil and, and all this stuff happens, when you step in there, the atmosphere just changed. Can you sense it? And then your, your, your mindset needs to be, God, what do you want to do through me today? Every day, my attitude is, God, how, who, who can I encourage today? Maybe it's that lady in the check stand. Maybe it's the person going down the aisle just to say a kind word, just to say good morning, just to smile, just to be encountered. Why? Because that's kingdom. That's what kingdom does. That's what the kingdom about. People say, I can't be you. Well, that's good. Be you. You haven't been called to be me. Thank God. My wife would tell you that's not a good thing. Be you. Why? God made you that way. He loves it because he made you that way. Be you. You need to hear this differently today, church. This is not a sermon. This is the word of the Lord to this body of people. I want you to, I want you to take it that way. I know that's strong. That's hard, that's hard for me because I'm I'm stepping in a new office. It's more apostolic. That's, I understand that. I don't like that. I'm this little country boy from Louisiana. Never liked passing through a mirror, in front of a mirror. I had people talk about, you name it, I've been there. Scared of my own shadow most of the time. Scared to speak in front of people. The best thing you could do is leave me alone, let me be by myself. But God, he changed my heart. And it started with love. I couldn't keep it to myself. This good news that he has given us is better than any news out there. Don't get hung up in that place. Don't get hung up in watching those things. You'll miss what God is doing. If you want to be misinformed, 
look at the television. You're going to be one misinformed individual about reality or Facebook or all the other medias. Don't form opinion from that. You're going to be in trouble. Don't do it. Don't go there. I love you guys. It's the only reason I, I risk saying what I know is right, but I love him more. Because I love him more, I'm going to speak whatever he gives me. And I'm going to do it in love. I hope you hurt my heart. God is saying to you, it's harvest time. It's harvest time. I was part of a church of about 60,000 people in Birmingham. And our pastor, our leader there, came from Louisiana. Our stories are so much alike. I knew his area. He knew my area. And we talked. He says, I was scared to death when I came to Birmingham. Didn't know a soul. I go, I'm, I understand that one. He said, but I, I believe God wanted to do something great in Birmingham. Now that church, I think it's been together about 17, 18 years now. 65,000 people, 18 different locations across the state, plus prisons and, and those kind of things. And he said in his message, uh, preaching in the, on Easter, he said, people say the Church of the Highlands is too big. He's preaching on the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. And in Old Testament, when they s celebrated Passover, they had to have a lamb slain. And they were to roast it and eat it. And it was not to be left over from the next day. Or it would be thrown away. So the whole idea was to get more people, if your family was too small to consume it, is get other families in there with you to consume the lamb. He said that Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world for us. And as long as there is more of Jesus to give away, I tell you, we're not big enough. People in St. Joe, people of restoration, there is more of the lamb to give away. It has nothing to do with size. It has to do with God wants to do a work in this city. What if you become a model that others would come and see of how a church participate with principalities and other other things around this city not to condemn but to help how many doors would open for you not to judge not to criticize but to love and tap into the mind of God it works guys I've seen it work in the business world I, I, God would give me ideas and some of them are still I've been out of the business uh, in here for 18 years, and some of those things are still being used now. And people don't have a clue. Those came from God. I just sit down and look at the problem and say, God, you, you can solve this. Tell me. And he begins to speak to me. That's the spirit that lives in every one of you, to be problem solvers, not finger pointers. Not to sit on the sideline and be spectators, but be participators and building the kingdom of God and involved in your city. To be salt and light where you are. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? You may not like it. That's a whole different area. You have that. That's between you and God. I'm just the male man. So I want to pray over this people, and then I'll turn this back over to Pastor Tim. Father God, I pray for this people whom you love and whom love you. Lord, let, us, let them find their identity in who you are. Let them believe who you say they are. Lord, I just pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would point out any areas of their lives that their knee has not bowed to the you, the King of kings and the lords of lords, so that they can be equipped to do the work of the ministry. Lord, I pray fruit come from this place. I pray these people would gather around uh, Pastor Tim 
and his family and the worship team and all of its leaders, Lord, that are striving to move this, this body of people to not only restore and rebuild, not only to heal, but see it become what it was intended in your heart to be. It's a portal where people come through, has been, where people come through to go to other places. I believe you have a voice in the going, in the comings of this city. And so, Lord God, be exalted in this place. I pray your anointing would fall on this people today, that they would hear your voice and be willing to adhere to it because they love you and you love them. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Yes, God. Amen. Amen. Can we show James some love this morning? James has been a part of our journey for over 20 years now, and we had our, our ministry to churches. Uh, he was on our board, and we just walked together. And uh, yesterday, he and Krista and I were in the immersion waters there at House of David. And with Rabbi's team, we prayed personally over more than 400 people, uh, three hours in the water yesterday. Some a little pruny today, but it was good for a cause. And today, if you need prayer for any reason, I would encourage you to not leave this place, especially if you've never said yes to Jesus. That's why we do this. So you can know the God who, who is so crazy about you that he sent his son to die on your behalf. And I love what we sang earlier. He wants you to come on up and join me. We sang the, the words of that new song. It's like, I was, I was in Oklahoma listening to my car radio and I heard this song. And I said, that's our song. That's our song for this 50 year anniversary. I know breakthrough is coming. By faith, I see a miracle. My God made me a promise and he won't stop now. Amen. I know breakthrough is coming. By faith, I see a miracle. My God made me a promise and he won't stop now. Let that be our prayer, our prayer of faith as we leave this place today and we walk into this new year, biblical year 5779, five-year anniversary of Restoration Church. Come back tonight at six o'clock. Let's celebrate with House of David and let's enter a new season rejoicing in what God wants to do through us, his people. Amen. Let's applaud heaven this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, we love what is happening here at Second and Friends in the heart of beautiful, historic downtown St. Joseph, Missouri. I hope this service today blessed you. It's spoken to your life. God has a way of delivering the message that we need at just the right time. And I pray that's what today has been. If we can pray with you further about anything in your life, we would be honored to do so. You can just go to our website. That's restorationstj.com. Restorationstj.com. Dot com. And there you'll find uh, all kinds of resources, ways to connect with us. If you want to leave a prayer request, we would be honored to pray with you. If you'd like to give to support this work, I mean, we are a work of faith and we exist based on the generosity and the faithfulness of those who enjoy the product. You know, I've heard from so many people that says, if you receive, then that's something that you can then help support. You can give into, you can sow seed into. That just helps us to continue this live stream and to continue to bless people around the world. It's amazing how many people are being able to connect with what's happening here in St. Joseph via the technology of live stream. So thanks again for watching. Again, visit us at restorationstj.com or better yet, in person at Second and Francis here in St. Joseph, Missouri. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you again soon.